afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Joelle Kuzam, a partner with Bricker Graydon's Employment and Labor Law Group, and I'm very proud to serve as a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. I'm also the city attorney for Grandview Heights, and I feel very passionately about today's topic. Thank you to today's forum sponsors, the Ohio Mayor's Alliance and Bricker Graydon LLP. Thank you to, today, to today's forum partner, the League of Women Voters of Central Ohio, and our host, the Ellis, for its generous support. We're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting our live stream, which is being carried right now on CMC's social media platforms. Let's thank everyone for today's support. Today, with the help of our amazing panel, we're going to unpack an issue that directly or indirectly impacts the lives of nearly every Ohioan. In Ohio, cities that have attempted to enact their own regulations to address gun violence have run up against a brick wall where municipal home rule and their governing authority ends and the, city, the state's authority begins. Cities that have attempted to reduce the use of tobacco and plastic shopping bags have also run up against these barriers where state and federal laws are held to preempt municipal laws. Should Ohio have the right to take up their own measure to reduce gun violence and address other issues? That's the focus of today's forum. Whose rights win? Gun violence, preemption, and home rule in Ohio. To introduce our esteemed panelists, please help me welcome Carrie McCarthy with today's sponsor, the Ohio Mayor's Alliance, to the podium. Carrie, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Joel, uh, and thank you to Sophia, Doug, and the entire CMC team for helping to bring these important community conversations to life. Uh, I'm Kerry McCarthy. I'm the executive director of the Ohio Mayor's Alliance. Uh, formed in 2016, the Ohio Mayor's Alliance is a bipartisan coalition of mayors in Ohio's 30 largest cities. Uh, we bring together the mayors to help them speak with one voice about the issues that are important to their cities and their constituents. Uh, our members here in Central Ohio include Mayor Ike Stage of Grove City, Mayor Joe Begney in Reynoldsburg, Mayor David Scheffler in Lancaster, Mayor Andrew Ginther in Columbus, and Mayor Jane Fox from Dublin, who's here with us today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mayor Fox and the rest of the mayors and elected officials who are in the audience today. As uh, Joelle said, one issue that is critically important to our mayors is protecting the right to home rule and local self-governance. Mayors and city council members are elected by voters in their cities, and they're expected to respond to the issues and concerns of those residents. That's how representative democracy works. But over the last 20 to 30 years, the state legislature has made it difficult for local elected officials to exercise their state constitutional rights and respond to the issues their residents care about. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how state preemption laws have attempted to limit local authority. Specifically, we'll be addressing, uh, we'll be discussing local gun safety measures aimed at reducing gun violence and improving public safety. But this is not the only issue that, that is impacted by state preemption. The state legislature over the previous decade uh, has attempted, uh, has repeatedly attempted over the years to limit local authority on issues related to environmental protections, predatory lending, minimum wage laws, roadway safety, and of course, gun violence. While well, the Ohio Constitution clearly gives the local charter municipalities the quote, authorities to exercise all powers of local self-government, how that language has been interpreted, interpreted by the legislature and the courts has been a subject of much debate. Today, we have a great panel of experts to help us continue that debate uh, and dig into a complicated but really important issue for anyone who lives uh, in a city or around the state of Ohio. Uh, with us today, uh, and just to reiterate, uh, the, the bios, I believe, if you scan the QR codes at the table, are, uh, are available to read. Uh, but let me just quickly introduce our panel. Uh, with us, we have Zach Klein, Columbus City Attorney, uh, Amelia Robinson, uh, Opinion and Community Engagement Editor for the Columbus Dispatch, uh, Thel Robinson III, the founder and CEO of Halt Violence, uh, David Tyron, Director of Litigation for the Buckeye Institute, and our host, Claire Roth, Managing Editor of the Ohio Newsroom. Uh, please join me in welcoming our guest, and Claire, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And thank you to Carrie for that introduction. In 1912, Ohio voters added the home rule provision to the state's constitution. It gave municipalities the power of local self-government, as Carrie mentioned, and the ability to adopt and enforce, quote, police, sanitary, and other similar regulations within their limits as long as they don't conflict with general laws. So starting off with the lawyers in our group, what changed in 111 years? I don't know, Zach, if you want to give it a crack. Well, first, of, first of all, thank you to the Columbus Metropolitan Club, to the sponsors, the Ohio Mayor Alliance, uh, Bricker and Graydon, uh, and to the esteemed panel to talk about this really important topic. You know, something that Carrie said uh, that resonated with me uh, is it is an important but complicated topic. And I think your first question and talking about the history of home rule uh, is a great place to start. Uh, you know, Ohio, prior to the Constitutional Convention, uh, had a rule in place uh, where cities couldn't really not pass any municipal laws unless they had express permission from the state legislature. So if you think about that, you know, the cities couldn't do anything uh, unless they had express permission from a state legislature. That did change uh, and on the vote of the people and granting the referendum power, the initiative power, as well as what we now know as home rule. And over the years, uh, Ohio actually had a very robust interpretation of home rule. Uh, and the courts, the Ohio Supreme Court, the legislature, really respected the ability for cities uh, to determine its own fate. Uh, you know, I grew up in Belpre, Ohio. It's a small town of 5,000 people on the river across from Parkersburg, West Virginia. A lot different than Columbus, Ohio. Uh, but what's good for Belpre may not be good for Columbus and vice versa. But that's the beauty of home rule. And over the past 100 years, there has been somewhat of an infringement on the way that home rule has been interpreted that, from the city's perspective, feels like that we're getting choked a little bit on the ability for us to pass laws, specifically to this forum, about guns and gun to address guns and gun violence. Uh, so the court and the legislature over the years has whittled that away, which has made it more challenging. So. I would say up until the past 20 years ago, the legislature, uh, there are 20, 30, 40, 50 different laws on the books associated with restricting the use of firearms in the state of Ohio at the legislative le level. Over the past, I said, 20 years, pretty much all of those have been whittled away to nothing. They've all been repealed. So the state of Ohio at this point is a blank slate of what of of dealing with what can be done to address gun violence and gun laws and those things maybe were very popular uh, in the media you know like not informing a police officer when you get pulled over that you have a gun in the car that was repealed that and th several dozen others so in the home rule analysis and this is where it gets wonky and I'm going to try my best not to get bore you with the legalese but in the but in the home I'm oh, sorry my mic. Oh, there it is. I said, please, please do. Please okay. try to stay out of the weeds for yes. everyone in the room so, and then also those listening on the radio and TV. Because, I understand. I mean, and, if we started to get into the lawsuits over this, folks, we would be just talking bit by bit, month by month, week by week. There are so many lawsuits around this. So we're trying to just keep that absolutely. as general as possible. <laughs> Read you loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> so with the repeal of all those laws, what co the court has historically looked at is basically does the state legislature have a lot of laws in place that would prohibit a city from passing a law because it's so comprehensive? The state laws are so comprehensive. Well, in the state of Ohio over the past 20 years, the laws are basically zero. So when you look at traditional home rule analysis, that means a city has a green light to do legislation. And that's exactly what we've done. We've done legislation because there really aren't any laws on the books in the state of Ohio anymore as it relates to gun violence or guns. Uh, so we have stepped in and we have been sued. We have done the suing uh, in order for us to maintain and protect that home rule ability. And contrary to the Ohio Supreme Court ruling on this previously in a case out of Cleveland, when the Ohio Supreme Court ruled on that uh, uh, back in the early 2000s, they ruled on it when there were a lot of state laws on the books saying, oh, it's comprehensive, you can't act cities. Again, fast forward 20 years later, there's no laws in the books so we're allowed to act. That's about a simple 101 home rule. So we are going to get into the lawsuits in a moment, but I see David shaking his head and I want to give you a chance to respond. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And again, thank you to CMC and everyone, all the sponsors for inviting me. This is a great topic. Uh, so first of all, I think there's two things wrong with the topic. We're asking the wrong question. And when you ask the wrong question, you can never get the right answer. The, wrong, the quest, first question is, whose rights win? Well, the people's rights. These are cons people have constitutional rights. Cities and the state do not have rights. They have authority to, t to enact legislation. That authority is limited by the Constitution. Now, if gun control, the next question is, if gun control advocates cannot overcome Ohio's home rule barrier and reduce gun violence through local ordinances, well, that's assuming that these local gun ordinances are going to reduce gun crime. We are focusing on the wrong thing. We need to focus on violence, not on guns. You focus on violence, you eliminate gun violence. So then he says, uh, Zach says, well, we have zero laws on the books for, for control for guns. Well, that's not true. There, you go through the Ohio Revised Code, there's plenty of things people, both the Ohio, uh, Ohio has laws, the federal government has laws, there's lots of laws regulating firearms. Now, so then the question is, well, this, the localities want more laws. Are those a good idea? Do they conflict with the state law? Well, the state government said, these are conflicting. We need universal treatment of state of firearms regulations and therefore uh, you can't just say well we don't think you have enough guns gun laws on the books we want to add more we want uniformity throughout the state that's why you have section 9.68 which the supreme court the ohio supreme court said has said twice is valid and enforceable so I want to talk to you about that. Let's get a little bit more specific. We're kind of helicoptering over this right now. Your organization, David, the Buckeye Institute, filed a lawsuit about that part of the Ohio Revised Code, if I'm getting my numbers correctly. Correct. Um, arguing gun laws the city council passed last December violate it. Uh, th that part, quote, require uniform firearm laws in the state of Ohio. So can you briefly, and please know, we only have 30 minutes, so we're trying to be as brief as possible. Can you briefly explain your institute's argument as specifically it pertains to home rule? Yes, so we represent uh, six plaintiffs who, uh, who, so let me back up. So the city passed a law which does various things. One of the, the most controversial one or most obvious one is that it bans so-called large capacity magazines, which it says anything that holds, any magazine that holds 30 rounds or more is, uh, is a large capacity magazine. They ban it, ban anybody from having possession. There's already, uh, probably thousands of them in the city of Columbus and they're banning them. We said, look, the state of Ohio has already determined that there should be no, no restriction on, on, thir on 30 round magazines. And why is that? Because it doesn't make any difference. That doesn't have anything to do with crime. And I think the statistics will bear that out. We How asked, does that relate to home rule? And it relates to home rule because home rule is, well, it relates to the, pot, the, state, the state's authority to regulate this field as a general area of law. Mm -hmm. And so since this regulates a general area of law, then it can regulate this and to the exclusion of home rule. Mm. Okay, so the city has also filed a lawsuit uh, in May saying two state laws prevent it from enacting common sense gun reforms in the city's language. Zach, can you go through the city's argument for us on that? Well, I, I think with all due respect, to David, he's proving the point in the sense that he's making a policy argument of the merits of a particular decision and not the legality of one. And that's the beauty of home rule, is that cities can make a policy call of what's best for them. Uh, and the city of Columbus, in its efforts to curb gun violence, has passed laws like the capacity ban. Uh, it has passed laws that prohibit domestic violence offenders who have convictions from possessing guns, which by the way is against federal law, but not against Ohio law. Uh, it has required people to lock up guns if children are around. We had, I don't know if, if you all have seen the video that was caught on an indoor ring camera where the child finds a gun in the couch, points it at his face, and nearly shoots his head off. Uh, th like that person did plead guilty to our law, and unfortunately there's been about five to, s five to seven other dozen cases that police cannot bring to charge individuals for recklessly leaving their guns in their couches because of, of the lawsuits that we have that have stopped us from doing so. But that's the beauty of home rule, is that we answer to the voters to determine what is best for our city. And I am the first to say that passing reasonable restrictions for gun laws is the one of many things that we need to do. It is not 
no pun intended, a silver bullet in itself, but it is an effective tool along with investing in people and work that like what Thel Robinson does and others. It's also making sure prosecutors and police are empowered and judges make the right decision to put bad guys behind bars for a long time. It's people, police, prosecutors and the political will to change the gun laws. It's all four of those that need to be done. But right now, we can only do three of the four because of the the stonewalling of Republicans and the Buckeye Institute, with all due respect again, that are stopping us every step of the way from making a difference in our own community. Zach, if I may ask, you yourself mentioned, uh, I, I'm going to misquote you slightly, and I apologize for that, but you say uh, home rule rights have been whittled away by the Supreme Court, by the highest court in the state of Ohio. So what's the legal standing for this lawsuit? Well, the legal standing is, this, is the fact that when you look at the analysis of whether there's a comprehensive state scheme, and as David mentioned, he mentioned one of the many, many repeals that the state of Ohio has done. They have repealed the comprehensive scheme themselves, which leaves n pretty much nothing left, which then gives the city the ability, gives the city the ability to step in and pass laws that make sense for itself. It's not a comprehensive scheme just to say a city cannot do X. Converse that with landlord-tenant. Landlord-tenant is a law, if you pull up the Ohio Revised Code, that has chapters and chapters of what regulates the landlord-tenant relationship. It is an area where the sit at cities have a very small, if, if possibly no, way to regulate because it is a comprehensive statewide scheme. That simply doesn't exist anymore because of the legislature's, the legislature's decision over the past two decades in the state to eliminate all gun laws. So we have the ability to step in and do it. David, briefly, I want to give you the chance to respond, and then we're going to speak with our Robinsons on the board. <laughs> Great. So very quickly, uh, Zach has some nice eloquent arguments here, but the problem is the Ohio Supreme Court of the past 20 years has disagreed with him twice and said 9.68 is constitutional. Four other lawsuits have been brought. Two of them said 9.68 is constitutional. One said it is not on appeal. That case, that court was reversed. The other one said that, it, that certain portions are unconstitutional and reverted back to the to 9.68 as existed to two, in 2019. So according to the Supreme Court and all these other courts, 9.68 is valid and it is enforceable because we need universal treatment of firearms rights to protect firearms owners in the state of Ohio. Thank you. Obviously, we have some disagreement on the panel in Columbus, in the state, on all of these issues. But I do want to just expand our view just a little bit and bring in, as I mentioned, Thel and Amelia to talk about the very concrete problem of gun violence. We know that it's an issue here in Columbus. I mean, the Short North shutdown made national news. This is an ongoing issue. 2020 was a record high for gun deaths here. Something has to be done. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Thel, I was hoping that you could just very briefly describe what your organization, Halt Violence, does before, before I um, get into a more granular question with you. Okay. Um, thank you, Doug, for inviting me to this forum. And um, so Halt Violence has been around 10 years, March 3rd in operations. Um, our primary service is squash and beef. That's what we use in our culture uh, in the greater Columbus and the greater United States, they probably say conflict mediation. So we serve youth, young adults, and adults in the inner city Columbus. And when it comes to beef, we got street mentors that are relatable to the culture and that has survived violence to be able to relate to the, the uh, population we're serving to discuss nonviolent alternatives. In the nine years and some months that we've been in existence, we have squashed 75% of the disputes that we have been involved with, and 25% is ongoing. The most difficult beef to squash is when it comes to a murder. And you know, some people um, are with their family or friends, right or wrong. And so we don't work with the police. We're not anti-police, we're not disrespectful to the police when we're in the community, but the work that we do, it takes trust from the community that we serve. And so some police respect it and some don't because they have agencies out here working with the police, with the community that we serve, 
see them as informants because they take information and transfer it to the police and that's something that we don't do. Um, and then some of the layers, uh, the other four uh, programs we have, we have employment opportunities for felons. We cultivate relationships with individuals that's willing to work with our population and we help them get jobs, good paying jobs. Uh, we provide them with interview attire, uh, resume updating work, uh, mock interviewing and daily bus passes until they get their first check or gas cards until they get their first check. Then we got tutoring, mentoring, um, and trauma counseling. So, Thel, especially on that, that, as you just laid out what your organization does, which thank you, I think everyone, in here, thank you so much for what you're doing in Columbus. You work outside of policy, right? We've been talking all about policy, all about laws, but your organization you know, explicitly works outside of a governmental system. So given that, how do you see this fight over who gets to regulate guns? Is it just irrelevant to you? The population that halt violence serves, all of this talk that you just heard is irrelevant. So the individuals that we serve in Columbus, if they have money, they can purchase a gun. They're not interested in none of the topics that you just heard because cash rules in the culture that we serve. If an 11 year old, a 10 year old, a 12 year old got money, they can purchase a gun. So it's irrelevant to what's being said right now. So what policies do you think would make a difference? Or none, this is the America. If these individuals got cash in the street, they can purchase a gun. It's not a law that can stop it. It was just an article that we was involved with uh, when it talked about the switches. The switches uh, that make a semi-automatic gun to an automatic. Uh, it's been here since 2021 or 2020. So individuals know the consequences of being caught with a switch, which is gonna be severe time, it's gonna be an automatic fed case. The individuals that we serve don't care because when it comes to the beef that they got, if their enemy got a switch, they have to get a switch to stay on point with their rival. And that's just the facts, you know? So, you know, um, it's nothing that can be done about it, period. Nothing, uh, uh, except a changed mind. You know, you got some people that want to change, and you got some people that accept the consequences of that lifestyle. You know, we're dealing with three generations, youth, young adults, and adults. You know, this stuff is being passed down. It's, it's become acceptable. It's a lifestyle in the culture that we serve. Amelia, the dispatch has done polling of Columbus residents about this issue. Can you tell us what you found? Yeah, so basically what we found doing our research is USA Today Network, which is the dispatch is a part of, and Suffolk University, we polled um, Ohioans from all corners of the state, and overwhelmingly, um, Ohioans, Democrats, Republicans, they all want sensible gun control. They don't necessarily want cities to make their own rules, like I, it's only 39% of them who said that they want local municipalities to make rules about gun control. But the problem is that state legislators won't make these changes that people say they want overwhelmingly. Nine in 10 people said that they want um, background checks and they want training for um, people before they buy, you know, have concealed carry, but the lawmakers won't do it. So it's kind of like um, the Buckeye, the Buckeye um, Firearms Institute, I'm sorry, Institute. Institute. They and Buckeye have Firearms the, is a separate organization, yeah. just to be clear. It's, yeah, Buckeye it's easy Firearms to confuse. And I, the Buckeye Institute, yes. um, in a lot of ways, have the ear of our policymakers. Mm. So, and the people do not have the ear of our policymakers. We see that in a lot of different ways in our government. Um, and this is just not our poll. There's poll after poll after poll. Baldwin Wallace, you got uh, Quinnipiac, same, same results that people want um, safety locks, they want mandated, mandated things. So, um, and it's not just a matter of, you know, Second Amendment against people who, who don't have guns. It's all Ohioans, gun owners as well, that want these uh, simple safety measurements in place. We've been talking a lot about what is. The laws that we have to work within, the court cases that have gone to the Ohio Supreme Court, but I want to look a little bit at the shoulds, what should be. You know, 2020, as I mentioned, had a record high of gun deaths here. And so if, you know, and, and cities and rural areas, they face very different realities 
around firearms. So how should home rule work, David, in your perspective? I mean, should it just be state gets the entirety? Should, should cities be able to, at all to regulate problems that they see crop up here? Because it is different here than it is in Bucyrus, for instance. Constitutional rights are constitutional rights. We all have them. They're the same for each and every one of us, no matter where we are in the state. One of the other things we claimed in our lawsuit against the city of Columbus is that these uh, magazine bans violate the Ohio Constitution. The Ohio Constitution has provision for the right to, to bear arms, just as the Ohio U.S. Constitution does. So these sorts of laws that, that these states want to pass violate the Ohio Constitution's provision and the Second Amendment. So we've ch and agreed that, uh, the judge there in, D in Delaware agreed with us that that was the case, and that was the second basis for striking down the Columbus law. Now these laws are designed. You know, there's a lot of great policies that we're talking about. Okay, let's let it's, let's provide for safety uh, mechanisms for, gu for guns. Well, here's what you, every time you buy a gun, this is what they give you. They give you a lock. It's free. If you have a gun today and you need one of these, go into a gun store and you can probably get one for free or very cheaply. And as far as training, uh, yeah, uh, there's all sorts of voluntary things going on right now. The ATF requires every to pass out gun safety brochures when you buy a gun. And... Um, and, and so we need to, for safety purposes, you know, we talk about the importance of these issues, but we forget that just passing a law doesn't solve the problem. Education solves the problem to those that are willing. Some, we, we've heard, don't care about the law. They're going to break it. They're going to find a gun no matter what you do. But there are certainly things that we can be done. We should be educating our children in school. There's a great NRA program that says if you see a gun, Stay away from it and go find an adult. These are the types of things we ought to be teaching our kids. Education is really the key to, to resolving the issue. Let's talk about children and guns. I mean, part of this city ordinance was about proper storage, proper locking of guns. And, and Zach, I'm wondering if you can speak to that at all, that aspect of, that, of the ordinance that was passed. Well, I'm not going to accept a defeatist attitude that... A, that the law itself and the passage of the law is somehow we shouldn't do it because it's, there's people are still going to have guns, right? You know, that's like people are still going to drive drunk. Do we get rid of in all of our DUI laws? I mean, no, of course not. We still need to draw the line in the sand of what we think as a society is appropriate or not appropriate. The same thing with weapons under disability. If you're a domestic violence offender, I think we draw the line in the sand to say that you should not be able to own a gun. Uh, and it's a little bit of a red herring uh, when you interweave home rule analysis with constitutional rights and gun ownership. They're somewhat related, but they're drastically different. The constitutional issue of whether you, whether a city, I'm sorry, the constitutional issue of whether a city can regulate firearms or not is what we've been talking about boringly, the home rule analysis. That is separate from whether a particular law violates an individual's constitutional right under the Ohio Supreme Court, or I'm sorry, under the Ohio Constitution or the United States Constitution. For example, the Ohio Attorney General, David Yost, Republican, sued the state of Ohio, I'm sorry, sued the city of Columbus in Fairfield County, claiming that our safe storage laws uh, were unconstitutional via the Ohio Constitution's Second Amendment version and the U.S. Constitution's Second Amendment. And you know what the Fairfield County Republican judge said? He said, nope, the Ohio Supreme Court standard is for cities is just pure, plain old reasonableness. That's the standard. Is, it, what is, is a city, what's a city doing reasonable? That's it. Now that's different than the United States Supreme Court standard, which was recently changed by the court, which looks at history and tradition. They're two separate analyses. So what we're passing are reasonable, reasonable laws that I wish, to Amelia's point and her, the data that she had, the legislature did do something about it, so this moots the whole conversation and then would have another topic on a Wednesday about the Columbus Met Metropolitan Club because the legislature would do something. And I would love the Buckeye Institute's advocacy of to have some statewide common sense laws when 70 to 90%, depending on the issue, training, red flag, uh, background checks, 
if we all can get together and rally around the simple fact that 70 to 90 percent of us in Ohio want to see some changes that can make a difference. They can make a difference. Amelia, recently the dispatch looked at gun violence over, I believe it was a weekend or, or slightly longer. And I'm wondering, remind me of the name of that, of that piece. Um, the overall piece is called Under Fire, and the, um, that was 80 days, I'm sorry, 80 hours of gun violence. 80 hours of gun violence, yes. What were your takeaways? I mean, we're, we're close to running out of time, but I want to think about the reality of gun violence in Columbus right now. It's, it's, we're talking a lot of policy. It's a crucial component to think about the legality of this, but I also want to reflect on this reality as it exists in our city. I will say we had a forum last week, uh, the Columbus Dispatch in partnership with the city council and the school system had a forum and one of the takeaways from that forum is heartbreaking. We had a, a 14 year old, four, I think she was 14 years old. She goes to Columbus City Schools and what she said when I asked her what would peace be, she said peace would be going outside without worrying about being shot. So that's where we are in our city. We, are, have, we have children who don't have the confidence that they will survive the day. Uh, we also had a, um, a, a group of mothers on the stage. One of the mothers, her son, uh, she's over um, Columbus mom's uh, mur murdered children. She talked about the devastating thing that these women face. The fact that you touch your child's chest and that heart no longer beats. So that's what we're dealing with in the city of Columbus. And there are things, um, no, laws won't fix it all. Um, uh, talking to young people won't fix it all, but there's combinations of things that we can do to address this problem. And frankly, we have to do it. If this city is going to be successful and live up to its potential, it has to address this problem, which is a simple fact. You cannot have a city where people feel that they're gonna die just by leaving their homes or going to school or going to the mall, the Easton, the Easton tragedy, that's, that's outrageous that we live in a city where things like that happen, where another child shoots another child dead at the mall in that way, a child who had no business having a gun. So um, there, that's the takeaway I take from the entire se series. Our hands are not handcuffed. We can do things, we can come together as a state and as a community. And um, the Buckeye Firearm Institute and Buckeye, I'm sorry, just cr crossed the both of them together. The yeah. Buckeye Institute and the Buckeye <laughs> different. Fi yes, Firearms different. <laughs> are not the enemy, but uh, hopefully they become partners in this, where we can come up with things that are reasonable. We will be moving on to questions from our live stream and our in-person audiences in just a few minutes. If you have a question, please, please, please make your way over to the microphone now. And if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. Before we take audience questions, I have one final question for our panelists. You know, Home Rule started with a constitutional amendment from Ohio voters more than 100 years ago. We are seeing more and more issues on the ballot. Might we see direct ballot action either on home rule or guns in the future? Anyone can take that one. I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, I, am, I expect that to happen. There's been uh, uh, Mayor Bibb up in Cleveland wants to do that. But the problem with that is the, uh, the legislation, the ordinances that, they, that these cities want to pass will still violate the Ohio Constitution and the Second Amendment. And so while they want to do that, I don't think it's going to be effective. It, accomplishing what they want to any event I don't think I think that the, the provisions that they want to pass are ineffective and will have no impact on crime anyone else want to respond to that I think when we win in the Ohio Supreme Court we may not need to <laughs> short and sweet Thank you so much. Really appreciate all of these responses. If you have a question, once again, please come to our microphone or put something on. Uh, if you're watching online, you can put it into the chat. Thank you all so much for all of your responses to my questions. It's CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Lainey Cuthbert with CMC is curating questions from our live stream audience. Lainey, uh, we can't hear you over here. Just a moment as the microphone gets sorted out. There we go. Thank you, Claire. Online um, viewer Andre Scott asks, is there research that shows limiting magazine capacity will decrease homicides or crime? If so, where can the public review this data? 
Well, I'll go first, and Zach will probably have something to say about this, but I, I, the answer is I have not been able to find anything that substantiates that. In fact, we asked for that information from the city in our lawsuit. They did not provide any information to substantiate that, and I believe the evidence is to the contrary. There are, there are millions of these uh, uh, so-called large capacity magazines out there, and uh, they're, where in California they did a study to see if, uh, if banning them had any impact on crime, and the result was that the conclusion was that it did not. I think you see, unfortunately, a series of very high profile events right in our own backyard uh, in Dayton, where the guy had 100 uh, bullets, had a clip size of 100 bullets uh, magazine. Uh, ended up slaughtering people. Uh, unfortunately, in our, in our society, there's been numerous school shootings uh, where folks had high capacity clips and ended up killing innocent children. Uh, so I, I think un, you know, when you Google those mass casualty events that we're seeing on a regular basis in our community, uh, you, know, you think the nexus is both the velocity of the bullet and the type of weapon used, uh, as well as the unfettered access to having large magazines. We've talked a lot about what's legal, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's right. Building on your comment, um, I don't know a lot about it, but I, I think probably a semi-automatic weapon can kill 40 or 50 people in one minute. I'm wondering if the, what the Buckeye Institute would say is a justification for having such guns in our society. Why do we have them? A, a Semi-automatic weapon cannot f kill 50 people in a minute. Uh, that's a myth. Uh, and but the, why do people have these? Uh, well, so 99.999 percent of all firearms of this nature are used legally and properly. It is a very minuscule percentage that is ever used in crime. There's over 24 million just AR-15s out in circulation. They are all used. Uh, legally with the exception of very, 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 very few. And so those people that are going to kill with them will kill with another weapon. Most times weapons that are used by criminals are pistols. And so uh, some automatic firearms have been around for nearly 100 years. So it's nothing new. In fact, over 100 years at this point. Uh, so the 1911 uh, pistol was a semi-automatic fire invented in, in 1911. We can't so. deny that the technology has evolved, though. I mean, it is not like these are, oh, Amelia. Yeah, I was, add, like, I was, I was the um, first reporter on the scene of the Oregon District shooting. You know why? Because that was my neighborhood. So we drove into our, our, our alley and got out, got out of our car, went into, before we, we heard gunshots. Ended up going to the neighborhood, and the amount of damage that was done within seconds was unbelievable. Um, I saw bodies on the ground. Um, my neighbors saw bodies on the ground. So it's a myth to kind of say, well, no, you can't. No, you can mow down a lot of people in a short period of time. In that particular case, you had police officers there on the scene patrolling the neighborhood. So they were able to take this guy down relatively quickly. Um, the damage that he could have done if they were not on the scene is unimaginable. Um, tragically, um, you know, these young kids and um, fathers and mothers were taken from our community. Um, that should not happen. It just shouldn't. We had, we had a client, we have a client in this case against Columbus who as a an, a black woman who was assaulted in broad daylight in Columbus called the police, what she, like she was supposed to. The police came. They wouldn't even take a report from her, wouldn't do anything about the assault. She decided that day she needed to do something to protect herself. She went out and bought an AR-15. I asked her why an AR-15. She said, because they're easy to handle, easy to control, and they're easy for a woman to handle because, because of, uh, of their configuration. So people buy these and use them for self-defense. And it's, that is an important value in our society, self-defense. You know, what struck me, though, about the Oregon District shooting is from the police officers who said this kid was not even a great shot. So you're not even a great shot. You're a terrible shot, and you're able to kill nine people, you know, like, and, and terrorize a whole neighborhood and a whole city. So, I mean, yeah, that's, you know, it's self-defense, but it also does, does a tremendous amount of damage as well. Can we get our next question? Um, this one is for Thel. Can you elaborate on the specifics of how you mediate between groups 
uh, with who have disputes. Is your organization actually in the streets during these occasions, or do the people come and seek you out? So to the first question, um, we get the information from being in the street. We have relationships with the culture. The street mentors are survivors of violence themselves. So we don't have to go to inquire from many books or whatever, like we know the culture. So being in the culture and developing relationships with the youth, young adults, adults, uh, the schools, the corner stores, uh, faith leaders, everyone, we know what's going on. And when we do um, find out about a situation, whether it's a murder, shooting, fight, or a potential uh, shooting, fight, or murder, we get to the lead person and have that conversation. And it's not just a one-time thing. We might know that individual, uh, or we might have to cultivate that relationship to get to know that individual. Or if we don't know that person, someone that knows of us can be that liaison to get us to the point to have that conversation. So it's no quick fix. You know, so, um, and then when we do have that uh, conversation, we ask if they are willing to talk to the opposing party. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But when you have two people, two leaders from each neighborhood or each community or each gang or whatever it is, that's a plus. Because you have to realize that when these individuals are in the community, ain't no talking. It's beef on site. So at our west side location, we got a metal detector. You know, so individuals come through, they got to go through that metal detector. If they're on that east location, they get worn down. And we have a table that separates them, and we are there just to mediate and monitor, not control it, because we want them to feel in control. And so we allow them to discuss what led to the, the beef or the potential beef. And so we're there to make sure there's no disrespecting, no reckless eyeballing, no weapons, and just to be able to discuss what's going on that led to the beef. And some of these um, situations are petty, but at the end of the day, it's the principle and the culture. We don't condone it, but we understand it. And so when they are in a, a, a tough spot to resolve uh, the situation, then that's when we give our input, and if they like it, then we let them take control of the situation because we're not there to control the situation. We're just there to create that safe place so that they can have that discussion. And when a beef is squashed, it's not like it's a happy ending, they hugging and then they going on their merry way. No, it's just squash, boundaries are there and the respect level is there and they know that if boundaries are crossed, it's consequences. So that's how we squash beef without the police. Now, when it comes to, what's the second question? Um, we asked if, and you actually answered, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. You actually answered it, because we were asking if you were actually in the streets, during oh, yeah. these, or, so mm -hmm, the, the, or do they come to you? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, far as the street mentor, that's what their role consists of, being in the street, being in the neighborhoods, um, you know, just being amongst the, the shooters, the drug dealers, going to the trap houses, you know, having these relationships. and. You know, it's a dangerous job for a street mentor because, you know, they don't have guns, they don't have vests, you know, but they're there to do God's will because anybody can't go out there. People talk that talk, but, you know, when people inquire about it and then they hear about the reality of what's going on as a street mentor, because it's the difference between a street mentor and a mentor, everybody can't do street mentorship, and that's fine. But the street mentor has a difficult role you know, he's there when uh, a situation going off and uh, the potential beef is going on and the shot is fired. You know, just two weeks ago, uh, right across from the West location, myself was in the middle of a 15-year-old and a 60-year-old and both had guns and I stopped that 15-year-old from clutching that gun and shooting this 60-year-old. The street mentor breaking up a south side group of girls and north side group of girls, uh, breaking them up, and a gun went off right in front of him. You know, so this, this work is real. 
And then as far as calls, we get calls as well, but the majority of it is being in the streets. When we get uh, text alerts from the news channels, ABC 6, 10, and 4, when it's a murder shooting, we go into the scene immediately to try to find out what's going on while it's still fresh so we can prevent a retaliation. You know, so the work is critical out in Columbus. Everyone, uh, thanks for your time today. And, uh, you know, truthfully, my heart goes out to the kids who are truly suffering from this, uh, you know, issue because, you know, people who lose mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters, they, they, I mean, they're total victims of this. Um, Zach, my question to you is, as you mentioned, we have laws on the books that say don't drive drunk and it's illegal to possess fentanyl, methamphetamines, crack cocaine. Once we get a law established, and if there is getting a law established that prevents certain types of guns, whether that be semi-automatic, bolt action, shotguns, anything like that, and you still see drugs that creep into the community, so once you get these laws on the books and you're still seeing gun violence, then what? I, I think that's why you have to look at it holistically with the four Ps, and you just can't point to one specific law or a series of specific laws and think that all of a sudden gun violence will be ended. Uh, but what I do think is that some reasonable restrictions around weapons, red flag laws, background checks, safe storage, just to name a few, uh, in combination with investing in people and education, in combination of, of supporting police through enforcement, in combination of, of making sure bad folks, when they're arrested, they get lengthy prison sentence for violent offenses. I think it's all four of those Ps together. Uh, and I think that's what happened with drinking and driving, for example. You, know, you mentioned that specifically. You know, that was, as, as we all know, with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that was a national campaign once, once states kind of rallied around a more uniform uh, set of laws across jurisdictions that prohi prohibited drunk, drunk driving. There was also the national campaign with MAD uh, that, that helped break down the stigma of drunk driving and shamed people in doing it. Are there still drunk drivers? Yes, I'm the municipal prosecutor. We have docket every day full of drunk drivers. But I think we, we can say safely as a society, it's drastically gone down and that has made a difference, the laws and the campaign. And I, I think gun violence is no different. Having the, equipping ourselves with the right uh, legal and policy tools in combinations with continued and significant investment in children and families, in police and prosecution, all of those things can, can make a significant difference. And I know that the city council, when I council member Emmanuel Remy, who I think is looking to ask another question here, but like the council and the mayor and my office are interested in doing our part. Uh, you know, I, I think about this public, I think about public safety literally every day when I wake up and every day when I go to bed. It's like, how are we going to make Columbus safe? And it's those four Ps that come through my mind. If I could just comment quickly, I just, I, I think we are still focusing on the wrong thing. Focusing on guns doesn't do it. They are things, they are not, they don't jump up and, and kill people. It is the people, it is the, the that are, shooting people, they're criminals. We need to do something to stop the criminals. Phil is the only one here that is really focused on that. It seems to me that our governments, because they can't figure out how to solve crimes, they can't figure out how to put, take criminals and put them in jail and keep them there to keep them away from, our, from hurting other people. Instead, we have people, lots of criminals, recidivist criminals, that are going around. They're gonna find a gun no matter what. They're gonna misuse guns. They're violent people. That's where we need to focus. We need to focus on the people that are doing the wrong thing. Just like in drunk driving, we focus on the person. We haven't banned alcohol, we let people drink, but we say if you misuse it, you're going to jail. And if you, you misuse a firearm, you're going to jail. We need to make sure that they understand that. I'm sorry, I can't let that go because here's the deal. In the, when you look at the rest of the civilized world, the rest of the civilized world, they have the same sort of bad actors, the same sort of drug addiction, the same sort of mental health, whether you're in Europe or Australia or in South America. When you look at the chart of gun violence, gun violence, it's the United States and Kazakhstan and Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and the rest of the civilized world. So you can't tell me it's not the guns. It's statistically right there. Go ahead, go ahead. Bell, you had a response. So when you talk, oh, go ahead. 
Testing. So when you talk about the other parts of the world, when we're dealing with the black community, it's different. You know, so it wasn't the black community that brought in the crack in the early 90s and the pills and the heroin. So this world, this culture that we serve in, it's a, it's a lifestyle. So when you talk about United States is different from the rest of the world, this was created by the greater of America. This has happened all over the urban communities in the United States. So this is way bigger than what you're talking about when you talk about that. So when we're talking about changed minds, coming from a holistic approach, it has to be done without those four Ps. You know what I mean? Because everything, everybody don't deserve to just get thrown in jail. Some of these individuals, and, and I'm not condoning the violence in the community, but some of these individuals that got guns is for protection. Everybody in the, in the community that got a gun are not criminals. Some of these individuals fear for their life from going to the store or going to the mall, going to school because of the violent communities that they live. Now, do some of the individuals that we serve got guns because of the legal activities that they do? Yes, but some of these individuals got guns for protection. So don't sit up here and talk about and scrutinize what's going on if you really don't know what's going on underneath the layer of what's going on. I'll say one thing to that too. I'm we so, always please say quickly. that um, please quickly. criminal. Like, I'm real quick. I'm gonna be real quick. I promise I'll give you a hundred dollars. So I don't have a hundred dollars, but I would give it to you <laughs> if I did. Um, so we always say the criminals cr uh, commit gun violence, but you're not a criminal until <laughs> you commit a crime. So that whole statement always bugs me to my core because people can have guns legally. So how are you a criminal? You're not a criminal until you do a, a crime. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, well, I, obviously, we could talk about this for four more hours. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so I'll have to turn it back over to Joelle Kuzam. Thank you so much. I hope you found today's forum thought-provoking. I hope that you will leave and continue this conversation civilly with family members, with colleagues, and with uh, lawmakers. Thank you so much to our sponsors, the Ohio Mayor's Alliance and Bricker Graydon LLP. And thank you for today's partner, the League of Women Voters of Central Ohio and the Ellis for its support. We also want to thank our virtual seat patrons and the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. And our very special appreciation to our panel, Zach Klein, Amelia Robinson, Phil Robinson III, David Tryon, and our host, Claire Roth. Please join me in thanking them. And please make plans now to attend our next week's forum, Millennial Voices in Ohio Politics, here at the Ellis. We hope to see you then. Have a great afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.